Hello everyone, my name is Lucas and I'm thrilled to be here to be presenting you on this awesome event. Uh, well, let's get started to it uh, so we don't lose any more time, okay? So today we're going to be talking about integrating containers into JavaScript in several ways I've been doing this uh, and how did I get to this and how we can uh, leverage this power, okay? So basically, uh, these are my social networks. Uh, this is my email. Uh, my name is Lucas Santos. I am a developer advocate from Sao Paulo, Brazil here uh, at Microsoft. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me in any way, just put my social network dot L from Lucas L Santos dot dev. Okay. So if you want to know anything about me at all, if you want to know any other social networks, just go to info dot L Santos dot dev. Okay. Then, Let's get started, right? So containers, they are a thing now, right? Uh, they are containers, containers are widely used for a lot of things. They're used in several areas with several technologies. Kubernetes is here, Docker is, Docker is here, uh, and there's like a lot of stuff that actually uses containers. And uh, it's something that's been really active and really hot in the technology area. But containers are not new. Uh, they exist like since the 80s or something like that. They started in, in Linux. And we are not actually telling the whole story of containers here today. Uh, what I'm going to show you is just how we can make this work with JavaScript and why did I choose to do that, right? Uh, it's easy to control containers, right? It's pretty easy. Docker is here to show you, to show you that uh, we can actually control it via like a CLI or something. Uh, and basically Docker does most of the work for us. You don't need to understand how the underlying infrastructure actually works because this is basically, uh, you know, uh, not important for you to uh, get your work done. So uh, controlling containers mostly have been done by using CLIs or other uh, graphical user interfaces or something like that. But it's easy if you're human, right? Most of the CLIs and most of uh, everything we use now, they're made for human beings. They're made for people, right? So Docker CLI is awesome. It allows you to do a lot of things. And there are other toolings that are actually pretty good uh, in what they do to allow us to spin up containers. Kubernetes is here to show you that uh, we can have a good CLI with good control and a lot of other things. But the point of all that is that uh, we we need to create things as if they didn't were, uh, they didn't, were created for humans, right? So uh, all this tooling has been created to be used by humans in the command line interfaces instead of programmatically through an API or something like that. But what happens if you're not a human, if you're like a program on API or an operator or something like that? Uh, you might face a hard time by, you know, doing that for a lot of reasons that I'm going to show you. And now we are going to just understand uh, what is, uh, what we're actually working with. Right. So to present this to you, uh, we're going to use a technology called ContainerD. It's actually a tool that uh, was built by OCI. OCI is a the Open Container Initiative. It's built up by like a lot of companies, and including Docker and Microsoft and a lot of other companies. Uh, and the the basic idea, the goal of the OCI is to create a standard interface for all containers and all images that we use today. So uh, ContainerD is a high-level runtime. Actually, it's more like a runtime manager because it controls something called, uh, called RunC uh, inside a Linux machine. So what we're going to do today is that we're going to spin up a Linux machine, right? So I'm going to use a Linux machine uh, with ContainerD installed and RunC installed so we can run our demos and our examples here. So basically, this is why containers are actually widely used in Linux and not so much in other uh, OSs, right? Uh, it powers Docker. So Docker actually uses ContainerD uh, underlying uh, its implementation infrastructure. Uh, it was part of Docker in the beginning and then was split up into several other stuff. Uh, and ContainerD, differently from Docker or other tooling, uh, it was created to be manipulated through an API or an SDK client or whatever, right? Despite ContainerD also has uh, a CLI interface called CTR uh, because it's actually pretty easy to manipulate containers using the CLI. And basically, ContainerD actually does that uh, for you if you have like a CLI or something. You don't need Docker installed in your machine uh, and you don't need anything else installed. So it has a CLI, have, you know, despite 
being created to be used programmatically. Uh, but this is not important. Actually, having the CLI is one of the parts that uh, will allow us to control it uh, a bit better. But that was one of the attempts. But uh, container D uh, is actually widely used. Most of the container runtimes uses container D uh, in underlying infrastructure or run C in some way. But uh, it's not so easy for JavaScript developers. So if you go in Google or whatever search engine or whatever documentation you might find, you're going to see that most of the container things are done uh, using Go. Uh, container D is actually built using Go. Uh, Docker is built using Go. Uh, Run C is built using Go. And there's like a lot of other things that we can do, but uh, they are mostly, uh, you know, aimed to Golang developers. Uh, this is one of the examples. There are a lot of other examples. Uh, but basically, what we are seeing here today is that we need to import all the packages. And you see that uh, in this uh, right-hand most image here, that uh, we have a container D uh, client that is actually well integrated into Go. And you can just import it and actually create containers and delete containers and pull images and so on just uh, using the Golang. Uh, CLI, which is not actually present in JavaScript. But then uh, I actually came across a article that uh, made me think of it. This is actually not wrong, right? It's not actually wrong to be written in Go. Uh, it's performatic and it's a great code, uh, but it's not intuitive. It's not that intuitive for those who doesn't know uh, Golang or whatever other language. Uh, so I came across this awesome article by Mark Coase, uh, how to get a browser to communicate with Container D through gRPC. So I thought, well, if Container D has a gRPC interface, maybe we can actually integrate things uh, into JavaScript. So I thought, well, what if I did this using Node.js? Right? Uh, I, I know how to integrate into gRPC interfaces uh, using Node.js. I know how to do this uh, using uh, the JavaScript command line, and I know how to use this uh, on JavaScript itself, that we have like a lot of libs that uh, allows us to create a JavaScript, a plain JavaScript JPC interface, and that are very actually good to do this. So I tried a first attempt, okay? So the first attempt I did was sometimes good, mostly bad, but uh, it kind of worked, and it was ugly at all. But the first thing, uh, this first attempt is just a proof of concept uh, to show us that our two actually, actually there are two ways or even more ways uh, that we can integrate Containerd into Node. Uh, it's actually a simple way to, you know, avoid being uh, so, uh, you know, verbose and trying to actually not to know all the concepts. You don't need to know all the concepts behind Containerd to make this work. So the first attempt uh, was to use chat process. Uh, so basically what I did uh, was that I created a child process and I spawned this child process to actually create instances of the CTR uh, container interface. Uh, and well, this worked very, very well, right? So Containerd has this uh, CLI called CTR, which I already told you, uh, and it's able to do like a lot of stuff, maybe, maybe like everything that Containerd can do is able to do, uh, you were able to do via the CTR. Uh, command line interface. So what I did was just, I put all these commands into a Node.js process and try to build something out of it. Uh, I'm going to show you the code, but let's talk about the pros and cons of this first, right? So you might be thinking, well, this is easy. I can do this at home. Of course, you can do this at home. Uh, and I encourage you to do so. It's actually very, very nice to see these things working. But uh, the pros of this is that it's super easy. It's very easy to integrate using uh, a command line interface uh, and using CTR, using child process. Child process is actually amazing to use. Uh, and you have like a lot of tooling on top of that that you can indeed use. Uh, and well, this is one of the, the pros. The other thing is that it takes advantage of all the implementation that's already done in the CTR in the face. Uh, so you don't actually need to be uh, so uh, into containers or you don't need to know how Containerd actually works. So you can uh, make uh, everything uh, work inside JavaScript. You just need to know how to call a process and you just need to know how to control that. Uh, and well, it's a faster implementation. 
So basically, uh, you can do things very, very fast. I did this. In, in, I did this uh, container D client in like one hour or so, right? Uh, and can be integrated into any API. Basically, if you can uh, manipulate this through the code, you can integrate this using the APIs. Uh, so it's actually so simple that I did this. I did uh, this amazing container D API, which is basically a uh, you know vanilla JavaScript. Uh, running ES modules in the browser, and it doesn't need anything else, just some CSS and some HTML. And it kind of works. So as you can see, I can create, I can list images. So let's jump to the code, and I can show you this actually working. Uh, so uh, this is our code. And basically, what I'm going to show you is this uh, small server. It's built using Koa. Uh, so as you can see, it's just a few routes, a delete route, a, a put route, and so on. So we can create containers. This is our course. Uh, and we have a body parser and allowed methods and so on. So this is a base KPI. And this only calls the CTR. Okay, So CTR is a containerd client that I called containerd because of obvious reasons. And this is actually everything that does the work. Uh, so it's already running here. Uh, I run both the API and the application. So this is the static application that I'm running using the uh, Go Static uh, web server. So this is all the same, just to serve the HTML. Uh, and basically, what you can see here is that I have my implementation of Container D basically using just child process promises, and uh, this is actually it. Uh, so we have these actions that I freeze. We have the list namespace action. So I just exec a sync. So I just run an execution, a sync execution of CTR client. This is really, really just a proof of concept, right? So uh, we have an if we have a standard error, then we just error out. Uh, if we have a uh, another thing that is not a standard error, uh, we can pass this string uh, output. So basically, this is the idea. So I can parse the string output. I can uh, run everything that I need into this thing. So uh, basically, this is the uh, amazing container API. As you can see, I'm a backend developer. I don't have a lot of experience, and I can't do good front ends. Uh, so I can change the default namespace. Container D is based on namespaces. So I can change the default namespace, but I won't do this. I'm going to download. I have this uh, network manager here uh, open on DevTools. So I'm just going to show you uh, how these things are working. But I'm going, I'm going to pull this image. So I'm going to pull the GoVote API, which is a simple image. It, it, it looks like it. It weights more like five megabytes or something like that. Uh, then I can create a container from this image. And I have uh, this uh, website already open for, um, for our API. This runs on 8080. So as you can see, nothing actually happens here because the container is not running. Uh, but I can actually run a task to run this container. So once I, once I create this task, uh, my container is going to run here. And as you can see, I can actually use my API. And I didn't need to integrate anything into anywhere. So I just can I can just kill my task, delete my container, delete my image, and everything is going to be back to what we had before. OK, so this was my first attempt of creating something that uh, was going to be used as an integration for container D, right? So uh, this is not, it, it's pretty good, but uh, we have some cons. As you may have seen on that, uh, the first thing we have is that it's heavily dependent on the environment you have. So uh, whatever you were doing, uh, you just need to, you can just run this client if you have it installed in the same machine as your container D uh, binary. So uh, if you have like on, um, you have a machine with container D inside it and uh, you need to run this API in somewhere else, uh, basically, you can do it because it needs to be installed in the same machine as the API. Of course, you can actually run Container D, run this API, and then run a reverse proxy or something on top of it to communicate uh, externally or remotely to this API. This is uh, completely feasible, right? But uh, there are other cons on this. Uh, basically, we don't have any control over the process. So if by any chance the CTR runs into a problem or something that we haven't anticipated, and being honest, it's really, really difficult to anticipate any sort of uh, errors that happen in a 
command line interface because it's not meant to be uh, giving you all the details of the error because it's basically built to be used by humans, right? Not machines. Uh, so you can control all the process. It, you just control its inputs and you receive all these outputs. And this is everything that uh, it's bad about it because you receive a output that's basically uh, a giant string uh, and you need to parse this string to you know, figure out whatever, if you had any errors or something. Uh, some of the clients, like container D clients, CQR, they have a quiet mode that doesn't output headers or something, but uh, it's, you know, poor. I can't actually get the container status or the image status or task status because uh, these, uh, these informations are actually uh, hidden behind a parsing or a table like structure, something like that. And basically what you have to do, what we have to do is to parse this giant string and use string parsers and so on. So we can put this thing into data structures that we can manipulate. Okay, so this is the first part, but the second part is that uh, this problem doesn't allow us to give a proper error handling because we just know that this is going to be an error when we have a standard error output. And the standard error output is meant to be used for humans. So it's a human uh, readable error, and it's not a machine-like uh, error. It's basically uh, what we do is just receiving the error string, the error message, and we can't know for sure if that error can be corrected or not. Instead of like, we can just parse it by, you know, uh, we can parse it by rejects. Uh, we can use uh, whatever thing that we can, but this uh, is basically running all the errors in one place and trying to figure out how to parse everyone using regex and using, uh, you know, every sort of hacking that we can do in strings. So this is really, really bad. This is one of the reasons why this API and this front end doesn't actually return uh, a good error handling. Sometimes when uh, we run into an error like the image red exists or the image doesn't exist, uh, it returns like a course error or something like that. Uh, and I can actually return this because I'm mirroring this out and this doesn't return my error properly, right? Uh, it needs sudo to be run, uh, although this is actually possible to be removed. You can uh, configure it. Uh, you can configure its uh, container D to run this uh, in, is in, in, as another user. Okay. So there is a config file in, I think it's slash EDC slash container D, uh, config.toml that, uh, allows you to change the default user ID and default group ID that container D is going to create its, uh, sockets and it's going to create all this process. So you can actually change this to allow you to run container D without sudo, but, uh, it requires extra configuration, right? Uh, and actually this is the most important part, uh, we had the the error strings, we had all the output strings, which is kind of boring, it's kind of uh, complicated to treat, but it's doable. But uh, the only thing that we need to actually be uh, a aware of is that this is a huge security failure because uh, we can input anything into that. So if we run into any attacks or if we run any into any hackers or something, we need to sanitize all user inputs for our API because this uh, otherwise can be passed on to our um, container D client. And this can run some things that we don't want to run inside our machine, right? So you actually have to be very careful in that. Uh, so the conclusion is uh, we can integrate containers into JavaScript. This is the first way. This was the proof of concept that I needed to make sure that this was actually possible. Uh, but I wanted to do this uh, a real integration. Like I wanted to integrate this uh, without manipulating external stuff and manipulating uh, things that are already there. So I wanted to actually create something that was going to be native. Okay, but not so native because it's just gRPC, right? So uh, the second attempt I did was to read on to the container D gRPC interface. So container D was meant to be extended. You can extend container D and it has a gRPC interface that allows you to do so. So uh, if you have like, this is these are the, all the proto files and you can see these are all the concepts that container D actually has. Uh, containers, content, diffs, events, images, uh, introspection, leases, and namespaces, snapshots, tasks, and whatever thing else that you wanna do. And this is like the image service. Okay, so we have a get, a list, a create, an update image, and so on. The problem is you need to know how to do it. 
uh, because uh, the interface needs you to control every aspect of a container creation pipeline, from downloading images to uh, downloading blobs, reading manifests, uh, creating containers, creating an OCI spec for both the image and the container, uh, creating uh, all the bindings you need from uh, the file system to the container, creating all the flags needed and everything else. So basically, if you have uh, anything that you run, run, like uh, you need a lease for resources, you need to create a lease, you need to create a container and mix that up together. And uh, in other words, you need to understand how container D works under the hood. So in every aspect of the container creation and every as uh, aspect of how containers actually work. Uh, for this, you might need to, you know, read the OCI specs for image, uh, the OCI specs for distribution or the OCI specs for the artifacts or containers and whatever. OK, uh, the runtime spec, for instance. So uh, this is the, the example I want to show you. Uh, if, we, if we need to create an image like the list uh, RPC here doesn't actually get any uh, parameters. It's just a filter, a string filter to filter the images. Uh, but the create one uh, actually needs a image type. So the image type is not just uh, a full image. You can just download an image and pass on that image uh, to the gRPC interface. The image type is just a descriptor. So basically, the descriptor is just a name, uh, some set of labels, uh, a descriptor, a OCI descriptor, uh, a timestamp for creation and update. Uh, and basically, uh, the image is just a pointer to a set of blobs. Actually, the blobs are pointer to a set of images. But uh, the image interface itself, uh, I can't create an image without even downloading that. So uh, I can create this image. It's going to be there, but there's nothing behind it. There is no root file system. There is no file system at all. So in order to fully create the image, we need to download the content. So this is the service for content that we need to download it. And these downloads are blobs. As you can see, if I run like CTR content list, we're going to see that we have all the layers from our image. Like it's just three layers, but uh, those are the blobs that uh, I downloaded when I pulled the image. And in other words, you need to understand all the flux of how to download an image, which is not that difficult, but this is not very well documented. The documentation is sparse. It's actually scattered everywhere. Right, so it's possible to do it. This is what I did. I integrated with the GRPC interface. So let's jump into the code so you can actually see this working. Okay, it's not that immense example or something that's gonna take your breath away. But uh, in other words, uh, it shows you that it's actually possible to do so. So what I'm going to do here is just uh, I'm loading the proto files. So the proto files are here. Uh, they are completely descriptive and they are completely uh, downloaded into this thing. Uh, so basically, this is the content proto file and it's very well commented. It's very well documented here inside the proto file, uh, but not the whole pipeline process. Uh, basically, what I'm doing, I'm loading these proto files using the default gRPC module from Node.js. Uh, so this is, uh, it's a bit laggy because I'm using X to uh, execute Visual Studio Code outside of my uh, Linux VM. So this is running inside the Linux VM. Uh, so it's a bit laggy, but I'm using gRPC.js and the Proto Loader to load an image definition uh, and the content definition here down below, as you can see. So I'm just loading the content.proto and I'm loading the images proto file. I'm creating a client. So I'm creating this image client from the container D services, images, V1 images, and I'm binding it to the Unix uh, socket. So this is the address that we're going to bind to our gRPC server. Okay, container D actually allows you to expose this as a TCP and over HTTP server. And I can create this without any, uh, you know, uh, gRPC requires you to have a certificate because it uses HTTP2 uh, under the hood. So uh, we can actually create an empty certificate using this. Uh, and we can add this metadata. It's just a header, basically. So it's a header uh, named container D namespace. And we are going to use this namespace, JSCTR, right? So JS container D. And this is the payload that I can use to create an image. So it's the name of the image, the target. This is the descriptor, uh, the OCI descriptor, which is a, basically a size, a digest, and a media type. Uh, and the creation dates. So I can create this image using this payload and that namespace. 
and I can list all the images using a filter, which I'm just not going to use. Uh, for the creation, uh, I'm just going to use the content definition, right? So in order to do this, first, I'm going to run this for you uh, down below here, npm start. Uh, and as you can see, I can uh, download this image. So I downloaded that. So this image is now here. And uh, if I try to download it again, I'm going to have a error, OK? Because the image is already there. As you can see, the image already exists. As you can see, this is a very good error details. It's a very good error code. So as you can see, we have a code, you have details, you have a lot of other things. And uh, if I execute this on my amazing container API here, but changing the namespace to JS we are going to see that this is actually what we just did. But I cannot create a container from this image because uh, it's just a pointer, right? So uh, this is what I did right now. Uh, this is what I had the time to create for this presentation because these two uh, content definitions does not need actually any inputs. So this is the output from the container uh, as the content definition. As you can see, this is just a blob file that is put into JSON. Uh, and basically, this is what we have when we download images. OK, so now back to our presentation over here. We're running out of time. Uh, this is the pros. Oh, every every of these, every one of those two attempts have pros and cons. OK, so the first pro is actually we have proper error handling. As you could see, we have a basically uh, a basic uh, interface for errors and a basic interface for uh, handling these images and these uh, messages and everything else. OK, so we can actually return a proper error to the user. Uh, we have proper return codes, so we can actually return proper errors to the user uh, and allows you to fully control all the aspects of the pipeline. So if you have anything that you want to be uh, better or optimized, you have caching, you can do whatever you want from this pipeline. Like you can download the manifest and put them in a cache and then uh, download this. Uh, for further downloads, you can just look into the cache and then download all the blobs again or whatever. You can optimize it if you can like find blobs into different images that have the same uh, digest, you can just use them mutually or you can add whatever feature, whatever features you want. OK, so it's basically the whole control, the best of the control you have and it does not need to be in the same machine. You can, as I said, uh, config ContainerD to uh, output the GRPC interface into a TCP port, but it needs you to have a CRT uh, certificate. So you need to have a certificate file both for the, uh, you have to, actually you have to have a certificate file and a private key file to uh, be able to do that. But you, once you have, uh, once you have this, you can uh, connect to your gRPC API for from whatever uh, external machine you have. So it doesn't require sudo because you are actually connecting straight to ContainerD and it's practically nat native. Okay, so you're just using a native module, not native module, you're using a native protocol. You can actually extend this uh, this is the standard way to extend ContainerD, OK? So the cons are that it requires a lot of knowledge. Uh, I don't even know how to start describing this because I didn't even discover how to actually execute this in a pipeline completely. I'm doing this job. I'm going to tell you about this uh, by the end of this talk, which is already in, in hand. Uh, the documentation is sparse, both for gRPC in JavaScript and ContainerD, so you don't find this very easily. Uh, you need to actually read the source code for Go, or not for Go, but for ContainerD and CTR to actually learn how these things work and how to build the OCR spec. Uh, it's way harder, as you can see. Uh, and might be a problem to connect external servers since you need these certificate files, right? Uh, and you need and if everything to actually connect to external servers. So what are the next steps we can do to this? Uh, actually, this opens up a very good opportunity to integrate JavaScript into containers and make like CI interfaces or whatever actually you want to do uh, using containers. So what I did is that I'm starting a project. Uh, as you can see, uh, you can actually go into my uh, GitHub account and you can help me do this because it's really, really in the start of this project. It's container DJS. It, there isn't anything uh, that is actually uh, like it. So I'm building this from scratch. I'm going to use 
uh, everything that I've been uh, learning so far and everything that I can find on the documentations to build a very uh, native and very, you know, useful client for ContainerD so JavaScript folks can, uh, you know, uh, use this to build their own tooling and to build their own better version of containers, Docker, and, you know, leverage all these incredible tooling that we have into other languages as well, right? So let's add more knowledge and actually create more documentation for this. So if you know how to do it, uh, create more documentation, post about it, blog about it, and actually share this knowledge so we can create a better ecosystem, both for containers and both for the, the JavaScript folks and both for those who actually love containers and love JavaScript like me. So uh, basically, this is what uh, this is what my goal is uh, to create more documentation into uh, Microsoft Docs and whatever other uh, platforms we have to make more people able to create containers and to understand containers and to show them that containers are not that hard as it seems to be, right? So uh, these are the refs that uh, I took. So basically, all the uh, GitHub files and all the repositories that you're going to see here, all the code that I showed you is in these repositories. So uh, this is the integration example using just Golang and ContainerD uh, with a client. Uh, this is this is the JS ContainerD example that I showed you right here. Uh, and this is the ongoing work to the ContainerD JS client, right? This is Mark's article about uh, JRPC web interfaces, and he has a lot of good articles in his Medium. I really suggest you to go there and read it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, how he can integrate this into several other languages like Java. Uh, he can do this using GRPC web. It's amazing. Uh, and well, Mark's actually one of the people that I, gave me this idea to try to integrate this into JavaScript and make it work so I can share these things with you. If you want these slides, uh, it's on slides.lsantos.dev uh, slash integrating containers into JavaScript. So I'm just going to leave this here. And uh, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. If you want to talk to me, if you want to ping me out on anything, info.lsantos.dev. And well, I'm always available on Twitter, into uh, Facebook or LinkedIn, whatever, in GitHub. So if you want to help, just come on and ping me. So thanks a lot. And I hope you have a great day.